Well, thank you all so much for being here this morning. I am not a morning person, but I got up extra early just for y'all. And um, I, I wasn't expecting to see so many people this early, so this is really great. And I'm thankful to the entire Creative Morning team. Um, it's pretty amazing what they're pulling off. So I wanted to be a part of it. So when I was asked to come, I jumped at that chance. Um, well, I'm going to talk to you this morning about the process of building a novel. It's a uh, process that's pretty mystifying to the people who do it, and especially mystifying to people who read novels. So the thing people ask me the most about is, how do you do that? So uh, when they told me the theme was flow, I thought that made sense to talk about the flow of building a book. This is a process that this uh, most recent book of mine, Southernmost, it took me about eight years to write, um, and so it was a very long flow, and I had to find every way I could to keep myself in that flow. Um, and so uh, these are just some of the book covers from Southernmost. It came out last June, June 2018, and just briefly, it's um, about a 35-year-old man named Asher Sharp. He is an evangelical preacher in a small Tennessee town just outside of Nashville. And um, the book begins in June 2015, the day marriage equality is passed by the Supreme Court. On the same day, a devastating flood hits the little town where Asher Sharp lives. Now, for the fa past 10 years, Asher has been doing a lot of self-examination because 10 years ago, his brother came out to him and he badly rejected him and disappeared. And so ever since, Asher has been studying on this and really trying to figure out what he really believes in. And what he uh, finally lands on is that he doesn't believe what he's preaching from the pulpit anymore. And so when the flood hits, it leads to sort of a, all of this to a fever pitch. And two things happen that really uh, serve as the impetus for him to stand up against uh, discrimination. Um, and, and make a really principled stand for that. The first thing is that when the flood hits, uh, a gay couple who have been quietly living nearby in this little country town lose their house in the flood, and they come to his house seeking shelter, and his wife turns them away. She says that she can't have them stay in there um, in front of their child. The other thing is that um, people in Asher's congregation start to blame the flood on the Supreme Court decision. Now you all have probably heard some preacher do that where you know the, the hurricane or whatever is blamed on the gays or whatever group that they don't like. And so that happens. And so Asher just feels like he can no longer do this. And so he makes an impassioned plea to his congregation to welcome this couple in, into the fold there, and they promptly fire him, of course. And um, one thing leads to another, and this eventually leads to his marriage falls apart, he loses custody of his little boy, and then he kidnaps him and runs off to Florida with him. He runs off to Key West, where he thinks his brother is now living, but he doesn't know for sure. So um, before I knew any of that, that entire plot, all I really knew about the novel was this, this riverbank. It's my favorite place in the world. This is on the Kentucky-Tennessee border, and I did a lot of my growing up here. Um, it's near Dale Hollow Lake, if any of you have been there. And so I just knew that I wanted to write something that centered around this riverbank. And it, this image just kept coming to me. Um, and so I just studied on that for a long time, how I was going to work something out to be about that. Now, if you've read the book, you'll know that this particular riverbank really doesn't show up until the last three pages of the book. But the entire book is working toward that riverbank. The other thing that started the novel is that I read this little news item. It was in USA Today, you know, where all the news is really short. An Amber Alert has been issued for nine-year-old Jessica Hooper. She was last seen with 30-year-old Eliza Hooper on June 1st. And so I thought that would make a good premise for a novel, a kidnapping. In this case, it seems like it's a custodial kidnapping. The last names are similar. 
the, the ages work out that it's probably a mother who's kidnapped her child. But I thought it would be even more interesting if it was a man who had kidnapped his child because our assumptions about the circumstances of that really change. When it's a mother that's kidnapped her child, we have a, a positive reaction. We think that she's probably protecting the child. And when it's a father who's kidnapped the child, we, we have a more negative reaction. We think that it's done out of spot or trying to steal the child or something like that. So I wanted to flip the script on that. And I really wanted to play with a lot of gender roles in the book and in every way flip those and uh, challenge those, uh, the way that we think about rural gender roles. So the thing here is that, you know, what I have is trouble. And what a writer, especially a novelist, what we're always striving for is trouble. If we can layer as much trouble in there as we can, <laughs> then we have a book, you know? Because the reader thinks a lot about plot, and the writer really shouldn't think that much about it. The plot must arise on its own. So if you create a character, and then you layer them with as much trouble as you can, then you're rolling and you, you know you've got something good going so i have a preacher who has lost his faith there's nothing worse for a preacher than that um, to not believe what he's telling his congregation so that he's in some pretty big trouble already then he kidnaps his child so he's on the run from the law um, and we have the backdrop of, of this lgbtq issue that was really dominating the national conversation at the time and we have, uh, the book begins with this action piece of, of the flood. And um, a natural disaster like that really brings, can really bring out the best and the worst in people. And it certainly does in this novel. So right around the time I read that news item, I was invited to uh, Key West. It was the first time I went to Key West. That was in 2008. I was invited there uh, for the Key West Literary Seminar. So I got to stay for two weeks. And that year, Tiare Jones, hopefully some of you read her novel, An American Marriage, a beautiful, one of the best novels of the year, last year. She and I were the new voices that year, and we had a great time. Um, and just as soon as I got there, I knew that was where my character was going to run off to. Um, for one thing, I wanted to spend more time there. <laughs> Um, for another thing, Key West has a long literary tradition, and so they really welcome in writers. And so I knew that there were lots of opportunities, fellowships and things like that for me to do there. Um, but mostly it's just because the, um, the place is so rich that I wanted to write about it. You know, the sense of place is just so thick there that it's just a wealth uh, to write about. And I knew I would be able to easily immerse my readers in that place because it was just so rich. Um, the other thing is, is that it's the opposite of the place that Asher's coming from. He's from this little river town in rural Tennessee, and he's going to this island culture, this beach culture, this ocean culture. Uh, he comes from a really repressed place, and Key West is a very open place. I mean, the city's uh, motto is one human family and you see that all over the place on the sidewalks everywhere and it's the opposite philosophy of, of where he's coming from so it's different in every way you can think of culturally um, visually the quality of light is different going from a river culture to an ocean culture and so those two tensions working against each other you can see it's more trouble because we have those cultures up against each other and that works really well for the novel to pull you in and out of that. So to write a book I have to immerse myself as much as I can in every way so I didn't I had to not only be in Key West physically but I had to be there really spiritually and of course most of my research for this was I'm here in Kentucky writing about Key West so I have to just entrench myself in every way. Well like I said Key West has this long literary tradition Mostly people would associate uh, the literary tradition there with Hemingway, but also Tennessee Williams, um, Wallace Stevens, the poet, and the poet that I really latched onto was Elizabeth Bishop. And so I just read everything that had been written about Key West that I could find, all the great stuff. But the poem that really, uh, the piece of literature that really spoke to me was a poem by Elizabeth Bishop called Sandpiper. 
And so this is a big part of my ritual for this book. Every time I would sit down to write, I would read this poem. And the poem's all about how tough the sandpiper is as a bird of the subtropics. And it, it you know, it's just the survivor. And um, it, it also spends a lot of time on the beach scavenging. And so it's taken inventory of everything. And so the, the sandpiper is really uh, a symbol for my two main characters. One main character who is on the run, and in the poem it says he runs, he runs to the south as far as he can go. So that's my main character, Asher. But his little boy, Justin, is also just a deep observer, like the sandpiper is. And so it captures both of them. We're also told that the sandpiper is a student of Blake in the first stanza. And William Blake was really important to me in writing this book. You know, he was uh, one of the great minds of all time, poet, illustrator, writer, uh, philosopher, etc. Just totally a mad genius. And he is the first person to really write down everything that lives is holy. And that was my thesis for the book. The whole book is about empathy. And so this is like the the epitome of empathy, right? If you walk through the world thinking everything is holy, it changes your whole perception of the world and it changes the way you treat everybody and everything. And it can become a really hard way to live. And so one of my main characters, nine-year-old Justin, is so empathetic that it's, it's hard for him to get through the day. It's hard for him to walk across the grass without worrying about all the insects that he's harming, you know, and that sort of thing. And so I'm really examining the idea of empathy and how, as human beings, we must find a balance on how to be empathetic and really think about everything in a really highly conscious way, but also get through the world. You know, I have to be able to have a house to live in, and that means trees are going to be cut down, and I can't spend the rest of my life mourning and grieving over those trees, although I sort of do. But <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, and so. It was important to have this thesis for the book to, to examine that theme. Now the other person that really popularized this notion, he changed it up a little bit and he said everything that is is holy, is Thomas Merton, the French monk who is mostly associated with Kentucky. He lived at Gethsemane about an hour and a half from here for most of his life um, and became one of the major theological figures of the 20th century and, and the 21st century, um, mainly because he was so ecumenical. He managed to really join Christian theology and Buddhist theology in a way that was digestible to not only the most devout Catholic granny, but also to, you know, the hippies who were practicing free love out at, you know, at Woodstock or whatever. He spoke to everybody in that way and became a real touchstone for a lot of people. So when I was in graduate school in Louisville, um, I had a real desire uh, for the wild as much as I could. I had, I had never really spent much time in the city and so I went to the river as much as I could. Um, and on my walk to the river from my university is apparently the only historical marker in the United States that's devoted to a religious experience. As some of you may have seen this, it's on the corner of 4th and Muhammad Ali, um, which used to be, Muhammad Ali used to be Walnut. And so um, here there's a Kentucky State historical sign, and it talks about where Thomas Merton had an epiphany on this corner. And so I'm going to read you his epiphany as he wrote about it. In Louisville at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people that they were mine and I theirs, that we would not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. There is no way of telling people that they are walking around shining like the sun. So this was really important to me because these are the kind of characters I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with characters who think about uh, empathy in this way and they're thinking about they're trying so hard to be good people. And that's one theme in all of my six novels that I've published, and now that I can look back in retrospect and see, is it's about people trying to be the best people they can be. And I really believe that by trying to be good, we become good, even if we're not perfect, right? And so that's what's happening in this novel. 
And I was going to tell you a little bit about some of the inspirations for the book in books and films, but I'm going to breeze through this pretty quickly. But I will just tell you that as a novelist, I depend not so much on other novels as I do other art forms, photography, cinema especially, uh, paintings, photographs. But the biggest thing for me is music. And so in Southernmost, I had a soundtrack of about 85 songs that I listened to over and over. And every character has their own artist that they really love. Like my nine-year-old character, Justin, his favorite artist is Jim James of My Morning Jacket. And he actually thinks that uh, the voice of God would sound like Jim James. Jim James loves that, by the way. <laughs> and, um, and, and Jim gave me some lyrics uh, from My Morning Jacket to use in the book um, and, and was very generous in that way. Another character in the book uh, is obsessed with Joni Mitchell. And that really helps you to understand her character in a deep way, that longing and ache that you find in all of Joni Mitchell's stuff. Asher really connects to the music of Patty Griffin because her music is secular, but also, you know, there's something spiritual, deeply spiritual and theological about it. And so that's where he is right now as a person who's struggling with his faith and so forth and so on. I also listened to a lot of Celia Cruz to help me go to Key West, you know, and have that Cuban music always play and put me there. Sinead O'Connor, Jason Isbell. I can't do anything without listening to Brandi Carlisle, so she's on there too. So this is My Morning Jacket, and this is sort of the main song of the book that really informs it throughout. It's called Wonderful. Now you can hear the voice of God, Jim James. Took a long time to get Tom Petty's in there. And a couple more that I can't get it to work for me um, today. So by this time I've been working on the book about two years. And I am spending a lot of time in Nashville in 2010 because I, I work uh, quite often in the country music industry. And some years I work more than other years. It's mostly anonymous writing, liner notes, press kits, things like that. And in 2010, I was down there working on a Chris Christopherson record. And so I was in Nashville, staying there quite a bit. And the most devastating flood in 80 years hit. Some of you probably remember this. 40 people were killed, um, hundreds of homes lost, thousands of people homeless. Um, and so it was a really devastating experience for, for Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. And in working on the novel, I thought, again, I thought that would be a great impetus, you know, for all this stuff. And I told you earlier how that all happens. So I worked the flood in, and uh, it also gives me this great action piece to work with. I always like to drop my readers into action going on. I don't start with a lot of backstory and all that. I want you to feel like you've fallen out of a helicopter into the scene at hand. So here is how the book starts. The rain had been falling with a pounding meanness without ceasing for two days. And then the water rose all at once in the middle of the night. A brutal rush so fast Asher thought at first a dam might have broken somewhere upstream. The ground had simply become so saturated it could not hold any more water. All the creeks were conspiring down the ridges until they washed out into the Cumberland. There was no use in anyone going to bed because they all knew what was going to happen. They only had to wait. The day dawned without any sign of sun, a sky that groaned open from a black night to a dull purpling gray of morning and Asher went out to walk the ridge and get a full eye on the situation. He could hear the flood before he reached the top of the ridge, a cacophony of loss. There he saw the massively swollen river supping at the edges of the lower fields, 10 feet above its own banks, a foamy broth climbing so steadily he could actually see its ascent. So two years into the novel, I finally had my beginning. And so we're moving on through time. I'm riding, 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 any chance I can get. I'm soaking up what's going on in the world, the music, 
daily discoveries that keep me riding. And then in 2013, something really transformative happened for me. I read this story about a Methodist pastor in rural Pennsylvania. His name is Frank Schaefer. His gay son, whom he was supportive of, came to him and said, I want you to marry me and my fiance. And so knowing that he would be defying his own church, he married them. And as soon as the church found out, he was defrocked, as he expected to be. And they told him if he would make a public apology, he could be reinstated. He refused to do that. And so he became a folk hero for a lot of people, but especially rural LGBTQ people. Now again, if you've read the novel, you can see how this has a big inspiration on the book. I had spent a lot of time working in the environmental movement. And what I had seen is that, you know, there were a few people who were held up as being uh, the stalwarts of that, like Al Gore, somebody that always comes up, or other people I can't think of right now. But what I saw was that it was just the everyday people who were really making a difference. The people whose names never got in the news, you know, the people who were just going about their lives and trying to be the best people they could be. So I wanted to write about somebody like that. And so that's what Asher is doing. You know, he's just trying to be a better person. And he's, he becomes a folk hero for people too. Because since the book is contemporary, of course, a teenager in the audience films his impassioned plea to the congregation and it goes viral. So the same thing sort of happens as, as happened to Frank Schaefer. And by the way, Frank Schaefer is still working um, for LGBTQ people, working for their rights. And that's become his real mission as a, as a minister. And of course, you probably know that the Methodist Church is still really embroiled in, in a, a divide on this issue. So I, I tell you this just to tell you that as a writer, I am looking at everything. I'm walking through the world totally as a novelist, you know, and I'm, I'm listening to the people sitting behind me at the restaurant. I'm eavesdropping on them and I'm going to use whatever I can get from them. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading the news and I'm going to use what I can use from the news. I'm listening to songs from my character's point of view and I'm hearing what my character's emotional state is, I'm reading that into the music that I'm hearing wherever I'm hearing it. Uh, or when I'm in a, you know, seeing photographs or whatever. I am just a scavenger who is using everything that I can. And I, um, I, I, as a novelist, I have to turn that off. It's not something I turn on. It's something that I would have to consciously turn off. And I, I really don't ever do that which can become annoying if you're out to eat with me and you're talking to me <laughs> and the people behind me are more interested. You know? <laughs> My point is you have to do whatever to feed your art as an artist. Around this time in 2013, my youngest child came out to me and that really changed the novel too. And it made me think a lot more, especially about bullying. And so that becomes a part of the book and it became a big part of my social justice work as well. And it's an issue we really are uh, in trouble with in Kentucky, with legislation that's being passed to actually foster bullying instead of to help it. So that becomes part of it. My personal life becomes part of it. You know, I don't write autobiographical books, but my essential truth is always there. Then in 2015, something that totally changes the book is that the Supreme Court does pass marriage equality. So suddenly, my whole book is uh, now, you know, antiquated. So because the whole book's about, you know, people who won't, are, are aiming towards marriage equality. So the thing to do is to make the novel as contemporary as possible. So I went in and rewrote that. I added in the Supreme Court. And of course, that makes the book really take flight. And it didn't take a lot of work because thematically it's already there. The other thing is that there's a big evangelical pushback when the Supreme Court decision comes down. But Ruth said, deal with it. <laughs> um, and my novel is also saying that. My, my novel is also said, you know, we, ha we all have to live together and we all have to be good to each other. Um, and then, in, uh, right after that, of course, uh, Kim Davis refuses to issue marriage license. Now, the important thing about this is that all over the United States, county court clerks were refusing to issue marriage license. 
But the only one we know by name is Kim Davis, right? There's lots of reasons for that. I could do a whole talk on that. One reason is because she's from Kentucky. And it's always more fun to make fun of Kentuckians than it is other people. We know that, right? Um, but also, she, you know, she's pretty brazen. She's so sanctimonious, et cetera, et cetera. She's the perfect media figure for this. But it made me think a lot about, and she does show up briefly in the novel. She has a little cameo. It, um, <laughs> It made me think a lot about how I wanted to write a novel in which there are all these different points of view from a real homophobe like Kim Davis all the way to the most accepting sort of person and I wanted to look at that whole spectrum of belief and not make any of them into a caricature. Not even a, you know, a character that the whole media is making into a caricature. In fact, that made it more important for me to complexify that whole conversation because I don't think I can talk about an issue like this properly if I'm just uh, needling one group. You know, I want to look at the whole world in a complex way, not just the people I agree with. And as a writer, um, my main thing is to try to, uh, in fact, I want to give my, I want to work, I work the hardest on the characters I disagree with, you know? Oscar Wilde said he gave his best lines to the characters he disagreed with, and that's really true because you're working harder on them. So by uh, 2015, you can see this is sort of a picture of the whole process, the way that I worked through revising and all that. It's a re like I said, it's a really long process. This book took about eight years um, from beginning to, to, to selling it. And it changes and evolves and it's been moved all around and it's more like working a puzzle or making a quilt than anything else. Now the last thing that I'll leave you with is that throughout the entire seven or eight years, that I was working on the book, I had these writing assistants who were really important to me. And when the book was finished, I read back through it and I really realized that dogs were always uh, a manifestation of the divine. For instance, um, or faith or belief, or however you want to think about it. In the beginning of the book, a dog is missing and a man's faith is missing. By the end of the book, a dog is found, so sort of giving it away there a little bit that faith is found. By the way, I will say here, as uh, somebody from Eastern Kentucky, there's always one word in a book that I have to say a lot when I'm on book tour that when I'm in different parts of the country, people really react to him for this book, it's dog. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just can't make my mouth shape of that word in a different way. Um, it's not natural for me to say dog. Is that how it's supposed to be said? Anyway, in, previous, in a previous book it was the word O-I-L, which where I'm from we'd say all. But anyway, um, dogs are really important in this book and I never consciously plant symbols or motifs or metaphors or anything like that. I think symbolism only works if it's organic. It makes sense that, you know, when I read back through the book, that these dogs are sort of, um, that dogs are symbolic of the divine, because I had these three dogs on top of me the whole time I was writing the books, you know, and they were really helping me through the whole process. Um, as a writer, ceremony is really important. And for my first three novels, my main ceremony was smoking. I would think, you know, if I, if I can write for 45 minutes, then I can smoke another cigarette. And then I'll write for 30 minutes and I'll smoke a cigarette, et cetera. So when I quit smoking it, it really messed me up as a writer. <laughs> so I had to come up with new ceremonies. And the main one is I have sort of like a, a tea ceremony, like, you know, just making a cup of tea, there's, you have to slow down and, you know, wait for it to steep and all that. So it gives you a, it punctuates your writing day. But the other part of my ceremony is the dogs. And you know, I'll write for a while, then I'll take the dogs for a walk, and, those, and that walk gives me more than anything else as a writer. Um, walking is probably the most important thing for me as, as a creative mind. Um, so dogs are representative of the divine in the book, and so I'm gonna close by reading you this short little scene, um, and you'll see how that shows up. This is from the point of view of my nine-year-old narrator Justin 
or my nine-year-old character, Justin. And at this point, they're in Key West. They've not been there very long. And he's alone on the beach. Justin used to think the trees were God. But today, right here, he thinks the ocean might be God. All that power and weakness spread out for us to see. The ocean can do so much when it wants to, and sometimes it can do nothing. Just go in and out. The ocean is a mystery, and so is God. They are both so big we can't see all of them at the same time, but we can catch pieces of them here and there. Justin believes God is big like the ocean, even bigger. Lots of people don't. They think God is small enough to fit in a church or an offering plate or a book. God is not, and God's mind is even bigger than God. People look at the ocean, and they usually only see blueness. But there are so many other colors. Right now, Justin can see 10 different shades of blue, lots of greens. There are lines of brown and the white lips of the waves. When the light hits the water in a certain way, there will be even more colors, red, orange, peach, purple. At night, there will be blackness. Justin thinks God's eyes are that color, every color. Justin thinks God is not only in the ocean, but also in his dog, Shady, and the sand and the trees and every person. Today, right this minute, Justin can see nothing but ocean, and that is everything. And Justin can feel the everything beneath his hand, where he is resting his palm on the dog's chest, and the dog's heart thrums in a steady rhythm like the waves on the beach. He can feel the everything under himself in the gritty sand. He can smell it in the seaweed. He can hear it in the voices of the people down the beach. The ocean is God, but so are we all. Thank you all. Wow. Sure. I need my coffee. Okay. Wait, wait. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to take a few questions. I'm sorry you all have been standing so long. I'll try to get you out of here. Any questions? Do you write more than one book at a time? Um, I usually don't write more than one book, but I have more than one project always. You know, I'm usually writing one novel, one play, one essay, one feature story. I still do quite a bit of music writing. Um, it, you know, just things from magazines. So I'm always, I feel like a juggler often. And that, that really works for me because if I get sort of uh, stuck on one project, I turn to the other and then I can sort of move around. I always think of it as like a stove top, you know, and one, one pot is really boiling and one's just simmering and one I haven't turned quite on yet, but it's in the pot, you know, and things like that. I saw a hand up over here. Yes. <laughs> well, um, yes, lots of simmering pots, but the main thing is a novel that I'm finishing that's, uh, it's, uh, basically it's about a, a man and a dog. Um, <laughs> They're, they're walking across Ireland together after a cataclysmic event. Um, and I'm also working on a play about Mary Todd Lincoln that I've been working on for about three years that hopefully I'll finish someday. And those are my two main projects. Yes? So you showed us the riverbank and you said that's where you started. And you didn't get to the opening scene for two years. So were you writing in the meantime? And if so, what were you working on? Um, I was writing, but mostly I was writing in my head. You know, I was mostly I was trying to get to know. I, all I really knew is that I had a man who was going to kidnap a child, and so I really tried just to get to know him. And so I'm just thinking from his point of view. I'm thinking a lot about being on the run from the law because that's a major part of the book. Um, and I'm researching more about Key West, you know, since the place is so important to me, so it's really important that I can pull that off as a non-native, I, I have to immerse myself. So there was a lot of work to do in that two years before it all really clicked. And all those things come together, you know, the flood, the Reverend in Pennsylvania, the K 
kidnapping news out on the riverbank, all those things, and the Supreme Court decision, all those things are coming together until I finally have a novel. And at what point did you name him? I, I name my characters really early that I can't really know them until I name them. That's something I work really hard on. Ash, the name Asher has a lot of religious connotations, of course. Um, and so I work a lot out of, out of Bible names. I, I use baby naming books a lot. I use real people that I meet. I, I was a mail carrier for seven years, so I still have a notebook full of great names that people on that mail route. Some of them are really dirty, I can't tell you. I, Publicly, but anyway, I, you can't believe what some people name the children. But they don't think about the ha anyway. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, when there are things that pull you away from a project for an extended period of time, after a hiatus, when you're coming back to something, how difficult or what's the process for kind of immersing yourself back into that story and making sure along the way that you're honoring what you have written, but also honoring changes and then allowing that to happen in a way that gives you quality work. Well, that's the hardest thing, you know, to work on one project eight years. I'm not a very patient person on anything except my writing. All of my patience goes into the main project I have at hand. So I think, though, the my answer to that is that Going, being able to go back and immerse myself in certain things is what sustains me for those years. You know, if I was just sitting there riding the whole time, I would get so bored with that. So being able to step out of it and give myself a break from actually putting the words on the page and immerse myself in a place or a character, all that, it gives me a little break that allows my mind to write more. Because most of most writing happens in your brain and not when your fingers are on the keyboard, if that makes sense. People, used to, people ask me all the time, you know, how many hours a day do you write? And I, you know, some days I go weeks and months without putting words on the page, but I'm always writing in my head. Well, thank you all very much. I, they asked me to bring some books, so I, did, I just have a few books. If you want those, if you brought a book, I'm glad to sign those. I'll hang out here and answer your questions one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks a lot for being here.